Good morning and welcome to First Light. Uh, we are in uh, a transition time now. We're moving from the beginnings of the book of Genesis in the first half now to the second half, which deals with the life of Abraham. We're gonna, let's start off by going to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9, we find the following words in verse 7. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 7. Nehemiah says, you are, he's praying by the way, you are the Lord God who chose Abram, also known as Abraham, and brought him out of Ur, that's a city, of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you and you made a covenant with him to give his descendants the land of the Canaanites. And on it says, I just want you to notice that you chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans are Babylonians. Okay, so all it says is that God chose Abram and brought him out from Ur of the Chaldeans. Now let's go to Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, and uh, in the beginning verses, Stephen is on trial, and he's going to be murdered in just a minute. But he's before the, the, the Sanhedrin, the ruling Jewish council, and he's on trial because he believes in Jesus and has been preaching Jesus. And we find these words in his speech. Verse 2, Acts 7, 2. To this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The, glo the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia. That's the Babylonians. That's the Chaldeans. Same place. Before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. Okay, so I want you to just notice here that um, same scenario, right? The beginnings of Abraham. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said. Go to the land I will show you. Okay, now let's go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis and chapter 12. So I had been taught my whole life that uh, Abraham lived in the city called Ur of the Chaldeans, which became the Babylonians, and that God called him in Ur to leave Ur and go to the promised land. And that's one of the great stories of the whole Bible because it's such a powerful story of faith. So let's just look at it now in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And on it says, that, and we'll talk more about this in, in a while tomorrow, uh, the promises that God makes. And then it says in verse 4, so Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. And on it says, and then it says, um, and they set out for the land of Canaan at the end of verse 5, and they arrived there. Now, I just want you to see how there's something already slightly askew here. Did, did you notice it from what we just read? Because we just read in, in Genesis 12 and verse, uh, what is this? This is verse 4, that Abraham actually set out from Haran or Haran. I don't know ultimately how you pronounce it. I, I say often Haran. Um, he set out from Haran, not Ur of the Chaldeans. So what's going on here? I... I remember being a little bit confused, but then I was even more shocked when I backed up a few verses. See if you're shocked like me. 
This is part of the genealogies that we so often skip, and sometimes they're honestly kind of boring, but sometimes there are nuggets of wow moments in the middle of a genealogy. So in, in Genesis 11, starting in verse 10, you've got all these people who lived and where they lived, and then they had children and had a son named this, and on it goes. And just jump down to verse 24. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah. Remember that name. That's a man, Terah. And after he became the father of Terah, Nahor lived 119 years old, had other sons and daughters. After Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Terran, uh, Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. And while his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married, and then it gives the names of their wives. And then verse 31. Terah took, notice the verb, Ter who's in charge? Terah took his son, Abram, his grandson, Lot, son of Haran, and his daughters-in-law, Sarai, his wife, and his son, uh, the, the wife of his son, Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. That's the promised land, friends. That's the promised land. So I'm beginning, I'm having a wait a minute kind of moment. So, so remember... Nehemiah just simply said that Abraham lived in Mesopotamia and, and God uh, revealed himself. And, but then Stephen adds something a little bit more, that before Abraham ever got to Haran, that God revealed himself and called him to leave and to come. But, and, and so that's, I, I always accepted that. That's what I always believed. But then I read Genesis 11, and I see that that's not exactly what Genesis says. I'm not saying that Stephen is saying something that's completely false. I'm saying there's more to the story than meets the eye. Stephen's just summarizing. He's just summarizing uh, biblical history to show how hard-hearted the Pharisees are because they never believed God. I mean, Abraham believed God, but they never did. These Jewish people uh, have a history of hard-heartedness and killing prophets and rebelling against God. That's the point of Stephen's speech. But here, when I look at Genesis 11, I see that Terah is gathering his family like a leader as the patriarch of a family. The oldest male usually did. He was the leader. And he's headed for the promised land now, friends, I tell you what, I I can't prove it. When I study the Bible, I always try to make it clear. I've always been taught that the call came to Abraham while he was in Ur of the Chaldeans. But when I read Genesis chapter 11, verse 31 and following, it sure seems like that call originally came to Terah his daddy. And Abraham was a part of that call, right? He's a son. The patriarch is being called. All the family and all the servants and all the wives, they're going at the direction of the patriarch. And so in that sense, Stephen's right that God did call Abraham back in Ur of the Chaldees, Chaldeans. But when I read Genesis 11, verse 31 and following, it sure seems to me like God called 
Terah, even though it doesn't say that. Why else would he be headed to Canaan, which is the promised land? Why would he be heading there? Now, friends, that is an astounding observation that maybe God called Terah. And then we get to the next verse. I'm still in chapter 11. But when, end of verse 31, but when they came to Haran, that's a town in the northwest, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and died in Haran. Now that's a little confusing because Abraham has a son, I mean, um, Abraham has a brother named Haran. And then there's this city named Haran, and often cities are named after people, but that's not the case here. Um, people can have names that are passed down. Um, for instance, there's two different people named Nahor here in, in Genesis 11. So there's there's Ur, which is in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. There's the city of Haran, which is on the other side. It's on the western side, the northwestern side of Mesopotamia. We're still in Mesopotamia. So God did call Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia, but it sure seems to me that God called Terah first, and then we see a horrible tragedy. He settled in Haran and died there. It sure seems to me, friends, like he had been given a vision, a call of God, this exciting journey to follow God and trust him and go to a promised land. And he got halfway and stopped. He stopped. Friends, I'm telling you, if this out, and, and whether that's a false understanding, that's possible. Maybe God never did call Tara. Maybe God called the son and dad went along, which is rather unusual, but it's possible. But either way, dad was part of the group that was headed for the promised land. And he settled down. He stopped halfway and never received the promise. Friends, I want to tell you something. This, uh, this uh, area of Haran with reference to, uh, to this call, is symbolic of not going all the way with God, of, of settling for second or third or fourth best, of, of a half-heartedness in following God, which is the message of the world, by the way. You only go around once in life, so grab all the gusto you can. TV, books, magazines, radio, uh, it's all the same message surrounding us. Many years ago, I, I was channel surfing on the radio. That's not something I like to do. I don't even know why I was doing it back then. But I, but I was channel surfing, and I caught, came across this song on some station. I'd never heard it before. It's kind of a peppy song. It had, had a good tune to it. I, I found out later that it was by a group called Expose, and the name of the song was Seasons Change. And so I'm listening to this peppy song, and the one line in the chorus, which of course the chorus people sing over and over and over again, right? Here's the line in that chorus. I'll sacrifice tomorrow just to have you here today. That's the message of Aaron. That's the message of the world, and that's uh, that's not an encourage. So then, so then I was uh, I was channel surfing some more. <laughs> then I was channel surfing some more, and then I then I find a song by the Mandrell Sisters, and it was a song about a man's kiss. Some of y'all even know this song, I'm sure. It's an interesting song, and the words go like this: I want to say yes. But I've got to say no. I'm torn between which way to go. I've got to say no, but I must confess, I must confess, I'd rather pay the price for saying yes. That's the message of the world. We're constantly bombarded with it, surrounded by it. To compromise 
our faith and our trust, compromise what's right and good and do what you want to do right now because the temporary satisfaction that you get right now is worth it in the end, which is the exact opposite of the message of the kingdom of God. With eternity in the balance Why would you do that? Jesus said, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Oh, dear friends, God is looking for people who are sold out for him. People who go all the way, not those who get stuck in Haran. They start out with him and then they settle down. Jesus talked about people like this in the parable of the soils. The sower went out and sowed the seeds of the word of God, and some of it sprouted in some people's lives. And then the heat of persecution or the cares of this world choked out the plant. They started with God, and then they never finished. I'm telling you, God's looking for people who will not compromise their faith who will not lose sight of the vision that God is laying upon them, who won't stop and get stuck. God's looking for teenagers who will grow up and be men and women for Jesus and not go through some wild rebellious period uh, and and not, not go with the crowd, but will stand up and be counted for Jesus. God's looking for working people who will serve him in their jobs, who will deal honestly with customers, and their bosses, who will be a light of integrity in a dark world of compromise. God's looking for men who will love their wives in the same way that Christ loves the church and gave himself for them, who will be involved with the lives of their children, who will be men of integrity and faith standing up for Jesus uncompromisingly. He's looking for older people who will use their resources and the time that God has given them to be a source of encouragement in the life of the church and lives of others. He's looking for people who will pray and seek him with their whole heart. God is looking for people who will not settle in Haran and die there, having a mediocre, unfulfilled life in the kingdom of God. See, Haran is symbolic of stopping halfway, of no longer striving forward. And friends, I'm telling you, even churches can do this. I have known some churches that started out with Jesus and they got stuck in Haran, a compromised self-sufficiency, a a lack of dependence upon God. Jesus talked about some of these kinds of churches in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. Have have you ever wondered, why would anybody do this? I mean, mean, either you're going to follow Jesus or you're not. So why would you start out passionately following Jesus and then just kind of flame out? Why would you do that? Why would you get stuck in Haran or Haran? I have some suggestions. How about love of the world? Remember, Jesus said some of that seed was choked out by the cares of this world. Why would somebody get stuck in Haran? Well, the answer to that sometimes is sin. I have known people who will come right out and told me, oh yeah, I know that I don't, I'm not going to heaven. I know I'm going to hell. But you know what? I'm just not ready to give up some things in my life right now. Isn't that a terrible thing to believe and to say? But I've met people who would say it. They are consciously making a choice of not following God. Well, Christians can do the same thing. They can, as the Apostle Paul said, they can make shipwreck of their own faith, otherwise known as getting stuck in Haran and not going on with the Lord. Well, I think there's a, there's a third possibility as to why someone would do this. And I think it's ultimately also partially a reliance upon yourself rather than God. I mean, think about somebody who lives their life and goes to church on Sunday. And, and they've maybe trusted Jesus as their Savior, but they go to church on Sunday and then they do whatever they want to do all the time. Well, friends, that's somebody who is not relying on God. That's somebody who is not living and searching and seeking God and putting their complete trust in Him. And then I think that there are also some people who get stuck in Haran because 
Friends, they don't know how to trust God completely. I mean, somebody who's been tremendously wounded or damaged, um, they've got a wrong image of God in their minds. They've been told some horrible things. They believe some horrible things. That They may be able to trust Jesus that he died for their sins, but surrendering to God, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a difficult thing for them. And, and if truth to be told, there are some people who are just flat out scared of God. They've trusted Jesus as Savior, but the idea of surrendering to Christ with your whole heart and everything you have, that, that just, that's just something they, they're not able to do. Something's holding them back in their woundedness. Well, for these and lots of reasons, friends, the, the people get stuck in Haran and don't go all the way. They live a mediocre life, a half-hearted life, and spiritually and ultimately, it's a life that's going nowhere in spiritual terms. So, if you happen to be there, if you're listening to this broadcast right now, and you're there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. How do you get unstuck? How do you get out of Haran? Well, first of all, don't harden your heart. Don't turn this off before it's done. You're still listening. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 says, Today, if you hear the Spirit's voice, do not harden your heart. Respond to the call of God upon your life. Secondly, keep the goal in mind. Remember Philippians 3, verse 12 through 14, where Paul talks about knowing Christ and striving for the prize. He uses that image, and, and that image is used in several places in the New Testament, including the book of Hebrews. It doesn't mean perfection, but it does mean not giving up. Proverbs, verse 24, verse 16, says, For though a righteous man falls seven times. You ever feel that way? I messed up again. I messed up again. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. But the wicked are brought down by calamity. So friends, I'm telling you, it's not so much falling down. It's getting up. It, the devil wants to, you to believe the lie that if you've disappointed God, you are out. But Jesus came to cleanse you and forgive you and wash you of that so that you can move on forward. Then, how about, you know, maybe we just need to continually visit Calvary. Maybe we just need to continually spend time in Romans chapter 6, the whole chapter, where Paul reminds us that you are slaves to the ones you submit to. You've been free from sin. How can you continue to live in it? Paul is calling us to remember to die to ourselves to continually put to death the self and my own selfish desires and rely on God. Haran can seem like a nice place to visit. It's comfortable there. But friends, I'm telling you, you don't need to live there. You don't want to stop until you make it all the way to the promised land. The promised land, spiritually speaking, is following God's plan and his vision for your life all the way to the end without giving up. He might pause you for a while, but that's his business. But friends, don't you get stuck and stay there. Just think, we say that God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I wonder if we could have said God is the God of Terah and Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob. But we don't say that because one man compromised and died in compromise. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your calling that you lay on our lives. And that calling varies, but it's ultimately still a calling to surrender to you, to your will, and to your mission to reach other people in different ways with our differing gifts and abilities. Help us, Lord, to love you. Help us to stand firm. Help us to hold fast and to not compromise. And Lord, if we've messed up and we're already stuck in Haran, I'm praying for repentance 
a turning of sin, a regaining of our passion. Like David said, renew, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Do a restorative work in us, Lord, so that we can press on and achieve the calling that you've laid upon us until you call us home and we breathe our last breath. For we pray this in the holy and the precious name of Jesus our Savior. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen all the way to the end. (laughs) I just made that up. This is First Light. Have a great day. 